Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it is, geez, the 16th, um, Tuesday. I think it's Tuesday. I, I sent you guys this um, PowerPoint for you to look at on, on your new, um, uh, this week's modules. Uh, I want to just go over it uh, and so we can maybe have a better understanding of what we're talking about and what we plan to do. Um, this week we are analyzing qualitative data. Uh, this is an important uh, session and I just didn't want to leave it to a PowerPoint and your own devices to try to interpret what's happening. So I really do want to get into this a little bit and, uh, and give you a general overview of what analyzing qualitative data means um, and where, and, and, and this way you can actually see or get a better picture of any kind of reports you may be reading, uh, you know, uh, studies you may be looking at uh, while you're doing your literature review, what's relevant, what's not relevant. The worst thing in the world you could do is read, reading a long 36 page um, uh, uh, study and finding out that it doesn't have the rich data that you're looking for, or if you don't even know what you're looking for. So here we, we're just gonna get, and, and everything is pretty much similar in how it works out in the, in the academic world uh, when we're doing scholarly writing. Um, so uh, you're gonna start, see some themes, you're gonna see some things happening. And the more you look and read um, some studies out there, and maybe I should post some so you could take a look at. I, I hesitate to do that because people start getting into reading those things and then they get overwhelmed unnecessarily when I'm just using those as examples. Um, so uh, maybe I will uh, do one or two uh, so you can actually see uh, what qualitative data looks like in its purest form in a, in a study. Um, so uh, let's just dive right back into this thing. Um, so what we're really doing in qualitative analysis is we are collecting data. Um, it's only the beginning of the research process, but we're going to collect the data. And once we collected this data, um, the information we have to uh, research, a good researcher will organize and think about the data, understand what's happening, and see if they can find some things on uh, this, you know, uh, wealth of information they've received. Uh, so you sort of try to straighten out uh, a lot of chatter. You're trying to streamline things. And, and what forms do data come in? Uh, they can come in surveys or questionnaires. Be careful with surveys and questionnaires when you're doing qualitative analysis because sometimes the questions on a survey may be a quantitative question. Uh, there may be a Likert scale. There may be something that has to do with um, uh, a different uh, sort of analysis type. So surveys, open-ended questions, those things are fine. Uh, but just be careful on doing that. Uh, you can actually get some data from newspaper clippings. Um, be be careful on that uh, route because a lot of news out there is not accurate news. I've seen, as a matter of fact, let me think. Uh, I may have a video that shows how um, a couple of um, actually, a, I do have this video. It's a sort of a, satirical, a satirical look at qualitative analysis or research itself. And uh, the uh, person uh, giving the presenter is showing how data is transformed into newspaper clippings or to short stories you see on on uh, Morning Joe or, or, or some kind of a news outlet um, uh, and they see how they distort some of the information on it. So I'll, I'll try to find that and put that on there uh, so you can take a look at it. Um, personal journals um, are good, good resources for information. Um, my favorite is doing interviews and I like uh, looking for transcripts uh, and, and, and looking at the transcripts of those interviews and seeing what kind of thematic um, uh, uh, consistencies that we will come up with. Uh, so interviewing is a wonderful way to collect data. You're getting rich data, real-time data from people that are living the experience, and that's what qualitative uh, analysis is all about. Um, obviously, you want to take some notes and some uh, uh, observations for your data. Uh, so uh, you want to make sure that all those things are codified in some way, uh, written down so you don't have to re rely on memory uh, because those things can get distorted. Your attitude for the day as a researcher may skew uh, a, a data point that you might have thought of differently in another day. Um, 
so, um, so these are some of the basic uh, ways you can actually find data um, and collect this data. Uh, so again, uh, what we're trying to do is we're not trying to um, solve every question in the world. Uh, we have a, a question in mind, a process in mind. We want to stay sh straight to doing that. One of the um, one of the issues that I that I see come across a lot of students in doing a research paper or a term paper or a dissertation is that they sort of look at things with something in mind going in, and all of a sudden they are all over the place. How many of you guys did that? I'm sure I've done it all the time. I'm, I'm I'm looking through the internet. I'm looking through Google Scholar. I find something interesting. It takes me totally off topic, and it's the, that information may it may sound good to you, but it's not helping you in your um, uh, question that you've asked. So you want to stay focused on that thing uh, because you can't waste a lot of time um, looking at all kinds of things. You become very smart, but it's all over the place. Um, so now that you got your data, I want to preach a little bit. I think I've been preaching already. Um, you know, uh, I, I, this opening I just put together because I want to make sure that uh, uh, we have an understanding of what we're doing. So I'll do a little bit of preaching right now. Uh, so you start your analysis by getting to know your data, understanding what data you're looking for. Again, you can get lost doing this. There's so much information out there. Um, you want to do this by listening to your tapes, uh, the transcribed interviews. Um, there's a really good um, uh, uh, let's see, uh, application or um, uh, technology tool that I use. It's called Sonics Text uh, Speech to Text. Um, you can find that so, and I, I'll, I'll send you the link. Uh, but you know, I pay a little bit of a fee, and if I hear, uh, if I got a lot of information that's on a tape or a recording or something. Uh, you can actually transcribe it into um, uh, text, uh, any kind of text you want, whether it's Word or regular text. And I find that to be a real big time saver because I'm not the best typist in the world. And uh, you guys saw that already. Uh, uh, so uh, having that sort of service is a good thing to have. Uh, so you want to make sure you look at this stuff, um, read it over and over again, get to know what's going on intimately. Uh, after doing this, you might have a general feeling and idea of what people are saying about your results, and you get a really good understanding. Uh, but you'd be surprised at how much more information you can get is contained in your data once you start going deeper and deeper and beginning to look at it in a, in a rigorous way. Uh, so you, you'll hear it the first time live. You'll go home and you listen to your tapes and say, okay, you know, this is boring. Let me get some coffee and drink, listen to this stuff. Uh, then you start writing things down, or uh, uh, like I do, I go to uh, Sonics and and uh, have it transcribed. Then I read it over. Then I read it over again, and I look at it again and see if I can find some things that are really interesting, uh, so I can really get a good analysis of what's going on. Um, uh, uh, what what we want to do is we want to have a uh, and I wrote this uh, fourth bullet point down for you guys. Uh, uh, you need to get a formal system of analysis, and how do you do that? Uh, you want to develop. Uh, you want to develop the data easily. Um, you want to, you know, in qualitative da data analysis, you know, we're looking at. Um, in, in this lecture, we're looking at actually interviews more so than anything. It's heavily on interviews. Uh, so um, you want to start looking at ways to ca uh, capture similar um, texts. You want to capture similar um, uh, anxieties or feelings or things like that. You want to capture these moments, uh, you, know, you know, whether you see someone angry or happy or, 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 or upset or, um, or they're finding their way. You, so what we do in um, the analysis is we use these coding techniques to find ideas. In the old days, um, we used to have to actually, I, I used to use a highlighter with 10 different colors. Uh, 10 different color highlighter, and um, and I start co uh, coding that way. I would highlight a word that's a save as angry. I would put it in red uh, or feeling, you know, whatever it is they're saying, if it's charged up, and then highlight all of those. And if I have a lot of those red marks, I know that there's a theme going here. This, whatever's happening is angering people. Or if there's, you know, uh, if there's another word that, that, that comes to light that you see over and over again, you might highlight it in a different color. And once you start seeing things, in, in its context, yes, number one, but then in its repetition, 
um, maybe you'll see you'll start seeing some themes develop and you start putting putting them in categories and relating them to one another. So that's my preaching story to you. Now there's a lot of good um, programs out there that actually do that kind of legwork for you. You don't need a highlighter anymore. You can go on Max QDR, and I'll send a link to you to take a look at that. Maybe I'll, I'll send a YouTube video thing. Uh, so you can look at what Max QDR is. You don't have to know this for any test or anything, um, but it's, it's a tool um, that originated in Germany or something. Um, and uh, what they do is they it, it takes those similar words and, and puts them into um, areas for you to code them yourself. So a lot of the legwork is done for you, and then you could you know pull out words and themes and and, and find things like that. Um, in quantitative analysis, that's with the numbers and and the uh, all that good stuff. Uh, we use SPSS or Strata or some other program to um, capture that. You can actually do some of that stuff on Excel on, in in in, um, in quantitative analysis. But here we're doing qualitative analysis, and we use something like uh, Max QDR uh, to help us collect this stuff as quickly as possible. Uh, let's go to the next one. Next slide. Um, so our lecture today, we're going to talk about organizing the data. That was my, that, that whole big deal was my, uh, <laughs> my little preaching words. Um, uh, so we're going to organize the data, find the organi organizing themes and concepts, build on overarching themes of the data, um, ensuring reliability and validity. And you're going to see a lot of that, uh, uh, and that's really important making sure that your study is uh, reliable and valid. Um, you'll probably see a lot more um, that in qualitative, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, quantitative analysis, those words, do not, um, because there's a lot, uh, you wanna be uh, able to replicate things and you wanna be able to make sure that there's reliability in your work. Uh, finding possible and plausible explanations for your findings and we'll go over some of uh, subject. I promise this won't be that long. So step one, the best way is to organize your data and go back and forth with your interview guide. Identify and differentiate between questions and topics you're trying to answer. And those that we uh, simply included in the interview guide, as you know, I, I, I did this one uh, thing with an interview guide. We don't, we're not using an interview guide. Um, but there may be, there, there are some things that you can use, some tools, uh, whether you're doing something like that. Uh, you want to make sure that your interview is is guided in the best way, and there's so, there's a lot of literature on that. We're not gonna that's for another class, um, but when you're doing a dissertation or a paper, uh, your interview must be uh, written down beforehand. It must be practiced on. It must be um, identified by um, the instructor or the IRB person or team. To make sure that the interview is valid and that you're gonna not you're not gonna um, uh, put anybody into some issues uh, where they may have a problem with it. Uh, so making sure your interview is put together is is, is a good start. So you want to organize your data in that way. Um, <clears throat> a model uh, for prioritizing, reducing, and organizing your data. You want to think inside when you think inside the box. Um, you're looking to get an interview. Don't try to do 20 or 30 interviews because you may be there for a long time. The study might not be um, uh, um, financed for something like that. Um, you might not have time. You're trying to get a paper. You're trying to get a dissertation. You're trying to get, trying to defend the dissertation. You don't need to have 30, 40 um, interviews when one or two can suffice to that issue. Um, uh, yeah, you can spend the rest of your life analyzing all that information. Uh, and believe me, when you go into uh, the first year of a dissertation, you know, you're, you really want to do all this good stuff. And in your mind, you want to interview everybody in the world um, and uh, want to come up with the best possible answers. That's not going to happen because there's a lot of people in the world uh, and a lot of different answers. And you'll be analyzing for the rest of your life and you'll never get even close uh, to getting an entire population to um, give you a uh, study, study. So you want to make sure that you get enough. So you're um, you're validating your work uh, and 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 you can move on. Um, thinking outside the box, once you've answered your original questions, look at uh, other ideas and themes that you may, that may come out, and and there may be some surprises for you. Look at them uh, in terms of how they relate to your question, and in terms of future research considerations. You might you might uh, in your work that you pointed to that you're looking at. You might have uncovered something else that might be significant. 
and you can you can say you know what um, in in your responses you want to have an area of consideration for future research um, that data could be organized to to do that and and you'll see in a lot of papers a lot of um, journal articles you'll see uh, at the end of the article at the end of the journal article they'll have, they may have some future research considerations um, paragraphs. Um, those are important because this, this um, whoever wrote the whoever wrote the paper uh, found some things that are outside the scope of their work, but interesting enough um, that it could validate for further research going forward. And that's kind of what we do. We want to advance the body of knowledge in that in whatever field it is. Uh, step two is finding and organizing your data, uh, organizing your ideas and concepts. Identify some salient terms, recurring ideas, language, patterns, and beliefs that link people and setting together in the most intellectually challenging phase of the analysis. Uh, this is Marshall and Ross had ri written this, and I thought it was an interesting uh, quote, and I carry this quote uh, for the past 10 years because I think it's one of the most important things to think about. Um, uh, when you when you are organizing your ideas, you can go off to a, a million different tangents when you're looking at some data. You want to make sure you find what you're looking for and stick to it. Um, make sure that the ideas are there. Make sure you see the patterns uh, of belief um, uh, that might link people. You may be doing something on autistic children. Uh, you want to stay focused on that. Um, I, I recall one time I had a student doing a, an actual um, uh, study on some some kindergartners, and all of a sudden she's looking at uh, something different that that um, involved the parents of these kindergartners. Totally off of her her paper, um, and she kind of you know went off to a tangent and was starting to look at different things. Uh, you have to stay focused uh, when you're working. Sometimes you got to put re put reminder stickies, um, you know, like right on your computer. Say, stay focused. This is what you're doing. That's all interesting and everything, but you got to stay stay um, keep your eye on the prize uh, because you'll be doing this forever, even though it may be more interesting than your original thinking. Um, so, what to look for in your words and phrases? So, you wrote all this stuff down. You went to Max QDR. You plugged in all the words. You, typed everything in, you did everything you could, uh, you highlighted things. Um, so you look for stuff. You look for, uh, what to look for is, you look for behaviors, you look for different ideas, you look for um, how things are happening that that might be um, uh, important to your work. Um, I cut a, 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 this is one old um, example uh, that I was talking about tuberculosis data. Um, it is what it is. I, I just want to make sure that this is an example so you can see uh, perceptions among family and community. Someone interviewed someone. Uh, the, the researcher interviewed somebody. And, you know, they, they wrote down everything and they started highlighting things like concerned and worried. And you can see when you highlight it, you'll end up getting um, uh, uh, these uh, good data points. Uh, so you want to make sure you keep a list and uh, see if you find some consistency on it. So, so these are things that you're looking for. Um, let me pause this. 